Do you like your movies? Yeah, I do. I'm really proud of part three. I mean, I had some problems with the middle of part two. I thought it bogged down. I liked the beginning and the end of part two a lot. I think part one is a minor classic already. And yeah, I, I think there's a I think there's a need for these movies. There's sort you know what? there's something that what the kids need? can yeah there's something the kids can call their own. Don't you remember? Come on, remember <laughs> back to your old Reebok, what you liked when you were 15. Yeah, Come but on. not scary stuff. I I hate to say this, Freddie, but I can't go and see your movies. I am too afraid. I, that's all right. You know, there's movies, there's all sorts of movies we all don't see. I'm not a big fan of watching Joe Clayberg take Valium, you know, but there's obviously an audience for that movie too. This is a movie for someone else. The slasher is one of the most prevalent types of horror movies around, and with good reason. It taps into the most basic fear of being hunted by someone trying to off you, often for no good reason other than they're nuttier than a squirrel's nest. Michael? While it's often wrongly credited as the first ever slasher movie, there's no denying that Halloween was the first to really nail it and the one that would expire the endless stream of low budget slashers that followed in its wake. Its simple premise, a babysitter stalked by a faceless, unstoppable killer, made it easy for the viewer to relate and as such made it terrifying to the teenage audiences that came in droves to see it. Simply put, Halloween changed hard cinema forever. John Carpenter's seminal slasher launched an ongoing franchise and kickstarted what we now refer to as the golden age of slashers. <laughs> this period of time began with Michael Myers stalking Laurie Strode in 1978 until 1984, with some scholars citing over 100 similar films released over the six year period. Despite most films receiving negative reviews, many golden age slasher films were extremely profitable, and today, even the most seemingly obscure have established decent cult followings. Now I know what you're gonna say. Fuck you! <laughs> hadn't thought of that. Many films reuse Halloween's template of a murderous figure stalking teens, though they escalated the gore and nudity from Carpenter's rather restrained film. <laughs> 1980s saw the slasher film at the height of its commercial power. Sean Cunningham's sleeper hit Friday the 13th was the year's most commercially successful slasher film, grossing nearly $60 million. We also had movies such as Prom Night, and he knows you're alone. You're fascinating. People pay to be scared. When you think about it, it's real ridiculous. 1981 is widely considered the pinnacle of the golden age of the slasher flick, with such quality efforts as Friday the 13th Part 2. My bloody Valentine. Comes a warning filled with bloody good cheer. Remember what happened as the 14th draws near. And the Prowler. In 1982, straight-to-video productions cut costs to maximize profit. We had movies like Slumber Party Massacre, <laughs> The House on Sorority Row, and a New York Ripper. In 1983, traditional slasher films saw less frequent output, but we still had some underrated flicks, such as Sweet 16. I'm not saying for sure, but it looked like the work of some kind of psychotic. I mean, who else would stab somebody 20 or 30 times? Psycho 2 and Sleepaway Camp. By 1984, the public had largely lost interest in theatrical release slashers, drawing a close to the so-called golden age. Production rates plummeted and major studios all but abandoned a genre that, only a few years earlier, had been very profitable. Friday the 13th, the final chapter, brought the saga of Jason Voorhees to a close, with his demise the main marketing tool. Simply put, Fans of the genre had begun to grow weary of the endless, almost weekly stream of low budget and high gore, but also high predictability slasher films they had been seeing for nearly three solid years. There were high points and low points, 
but most fell into the same familiar formula. The mass killer with the traumatic backstory stalking and picking off an unsuspecting group of promiscuous and drug addled teenagers until one final girl is left to dispatch the killer in a final showdown. Audiences were ready for something different, something that gave them the scares and gore they craved, but also the sophistication that so many of the first wave of slashes lacked. Please God. This is God. Horror films are unique and even more than, say, westerns used to be, are a very inexpensive way to make a film. All you need is a tremendous vision, a uh, tremendous energy. Uh, Texas Chainsaw, Last House, uh, Hills of Eyes, all were films done with a very limited cast and a very, usually a rural location where you don't have to pay a lot of permits. And all you need is a great idea and a lot of uh, vision. You go out there and make something that scares the pants off people. The basis of any movie is to uh, take your hero and chase him up a tree and then chop down the tree and the horror picture does that in spades. <laughs> Other movies sometimes can make this very abstract, you know, they can do it in a philosophical way or in a, the way the character's life is going, but a horror movie really does it with the fact that the guy chopping down the tree has an axe that he's going to use on you next. So you get very quickly engaged and it's, uh, I think it's a very immediate very, very simple form. Uh, in that sense, it's classic. As interest in the golden age slasher waned, Wes Craven's A Nightmare on Elm Street revitalized the genre by mixing fantasy and the supernatural in a cost-effective way. Developing A Nightmare on Elm Street since 1981, Craven recognized time running out due to declining revenues from theatrical slasher releases. The resulting film was wholly submersive, which is one reason why Craven had so much trouble getting it made. First phase slashers were human, often able to withstand remarkable punishment, but still essentially human and killable. Freddy Krueger was a different kind of slasher a supernatural killer that could bend the reality surrounding his victims to his will. Before, the majority of slashes bore expressionless masks. Freddy wore a mask of burn scars, but was far from expressionless. In fact, Freddy was a slasher with a remarkable amount of personality, something severely lacking in previous, generally mute monsters. Come to Freddy. In The Nightmare on Elm Street, Craven took the basic setup for the teen slasher flick and took it in directions that simply hadn't been done before. The film's simple premise of tapping into the horrors of dreaming and questionable reality was like a gift from the gods presented directly to the artists and set designers, giving carte blanche to indulge their fantasies and create memorable set pieces like nothing else ever seen in a horror genre to that point. It was a phantasmagoria of morbid humor and bad dreams. Needless to say, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and especially its villain Freddy Krueger, became cultural phenomenons. On a budget of just under $2 million, the film was a commercial success, grossing a little more than $25 million in North America, and launched one of the most successful film series in history. The success of A Nightmare on Elm Street welcomed in a new wave of horror films that relied on special effects, almost completely silencing the smaller budget Golden Age features. Freddy Krueger is every girl's dream and every girl's nightmare. I'm gonna have nightmares! Oh no! Oh, oh no! Freddy is the ultimate nightmare. Freddy's, Freddy's way sociable. He's Freddy's a party Freddy. animal. Freddy rocks. It's like Freddy is like addicting, and you you know it gets better and better each one. The scariest movie I've ever seen in a long time. I, I don't think I'll sleep tonight. Despite A Nightmare on Elm Street's success, onset fatigue hit the slasher genre, and its popularity had declined substantially. Paramount Pictures released a parody April Fool's Day with hopes to start a sister series to its Friday the 13th property, though the film's modest box office run never led to a series. Three other spoofs, Evil Laugh, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2, and Friday the 13th Part 6 were also box office disappointments. We better turn around. Why? Because I've seen enough horror movies to know any weirdo wearing a mask is never friendly. The Nightmare on Elm Street series dominated the late 1980s horror wave with The Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3 selling 11.5 million tickets in North America and The Nightmare on Elm Street Part 4 following another 12 million tickets. I wanna draw some blood. By comparison, Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, and Halloween Part 4, The Return of Michael Myers sold approximately 4.5 million tickets each, less than half of the Elm Street films. 
the original Elm Street was a sleeper hit that changed the game in a very similar way to how Halloween had. Now, horror movies needed to have a spectacular feel with bigger budgets and special effects that would draw the MTV generation. The personality-driven appeal of Freddy Krueger was not lost on filmmakers, as characters like Chucky and Candyman were given ample dialogue and placed in urban settings that had largely been ignored by the Golden Age. At this point, as we made our way into the 90s, the problem facing slasher films was that instead of shocking us as Michael Myers had once done, they'd become derivative to the point of almost being comical. That is, until Wes Craven's Scream in 1996 came along and changed everything, which we've previously discussed in another video. But A Nightmare on Elm Street will always remain Craven's capstone work. It manages to both encapsulate and transcend the slasher genre. Unlike many of its lesser imitators, it carries a deep sense of personality and imagination. It feels like the creation of someone with something to say about the world. Freddy's gleeful approach towards murder and subsequent gallows humor made for a very different breed of supernatural killer, and one that indeed proved extremely influential on post-Nightmare slashers. The interesting thing that's happening now, I think really uh, as a result of uh, films like Nightmare on Elm Street, is that we're getting into what I have coined as rubber reality, which is uh, films that deal with the way that reality can be distorted and permeated, uh, going into dream states, into dr in states of madness, and uh, dis uh, all sorts of strange illusions that uh, haven't been treated in film since Cocteau, I think. And uh, so in that sense, they're becoming less blood and guts and more uh, hallucinatory, which I think is basically what films are anyway. Oh, and meanwhile. Meanwhile? Whatever you do, don't fall asleep.